modified Hagee pin, which has differential threads and also some nuts on the lateral side. The more recent use of the titanium elastic nails. And lastly, this Sonoma clavicle repair device that's just been uh, FDA approved for approximately a year. The advantages of using an intermedullary device are that you can potentially do this through a smaller incision, which can be more cosmetically appealing and possibly have less pain postoperatively. Also, the potential for a close reduction exists in that you may be able to get the uh, intermedullary device into the distal fragment without opening the fracture site and leaving a more biologically friendly environment that may facilitate healing. One of the advantages of using an intermedullary device is that it is less prominent on the clavicle and in military and paramilitary type of occupations where a lot of weight is carried on the shoulder girdle, this may in fact allow for a more comfortable use of the shoulder. Also avocationally many people use backpacks as they commute to work on bicycles or go up into the mountains and they may have less problems utilizing backpacks in the future. However, these devices can allow for shortening and when shortening occurs, uh, we're not restoring the morphology as, as Steve has talked to us about and the pin can either move out laterally and penetrate the lateral cortex or the medial cortex. This can cause problems and require revision surgery. Also, these pins are not as robust as the plates that Steve has advocated, and therefore they can break. And sometimes they'll actually heal with exuberant callus, as you see down here. And this can actually leave the patient with a bump that can be problematic later and a cause for concern. Now, over the years, K-wires have been used uh, less and less frequently in the shoulder as we've learned that they can cause problems. And in this particular case, the problem was the device was not strong enough and it led to a non-union. This was salvaged utilizing an elastic nail technique. And you see on the far right, uh, a very good restoration and healing. However, K-wires have been noted to migrate from clavicles, fairly significant distances. In this case, the K-wire made it into the thoracic cavity and into the trachea. And you'll note some of the reports are quite recent within this decade. Another case here, a K-wire used to secure an acromioclavicular joint separation that ended up in the trachea. Another one that was used in a clavicle repair that ended up in the trachea and in the innominate artery. This final case is very serious in that this particular K-wire was used in a shoulder fracture repair and over time migrated all the way into the heart. And this was a fatal complication. So these cases serve as grim reminders that we need to be very cautious utilizing smooth devices in and around the shoulder. Uh, you may think that a threaded device is safer and that a threaded device can't move. This is not, in fact, true. This is an example of a chance pin that migrated from an acromioclavicular joint into the body of C7 vertebrae. And this is a close-up uh, showing that pin and the 3D reconstruction CT scan. So, these intermedullary devices are not without complications. Uh, brachial plexus injuries have also been seen utilizing this device. And in Dr. Ring's paper in 2005, three of 20 cases had brachial plexus injuries. Thankfully, these were transient palsies that recovered. Dr. Frigg had one in, out of 34 cases that were treated with a titanium elastic nail. And this uh, was purportedly due to the manipulation of the fracture fragments. So that gives us cause to be very careful in managing these fragments, even utilizing this technique. Hagee pins have been talked about as a form of intramedullary fixation. However, they have been noted to penetrate the skin and cause skin problems, and therefore require revision surgeries. And in this
a review of 16 cases, three found their way out of the skin posteriorly, two broke, and uh, these needed to be revised. However, all the clavicles in this series did heal. This is a case of a young 16-year-old soccer player that we managed at the University of Washington who had this displaced fracture. We treated with a modified Hagee pin or the Rockwood clavicle pin as it's called. He had very quick decrease in his pain and re returned to activity quite quickly. However, at about eight weeks, he had some irritation of the skin posteriorly and had formed a bursa. Thankfully, his fracture had already healed and we were able to remove the device and he went on to uneventful return to sport. In a review of a randomized clinical trial, Dr. Smeckel showed that intramedullary nailing actually performed superiorly to just treating these patients in a sling. All the fractures, uh, 30 in this group, united. And in the non-operative group, there were three non-unions, as you see, and two malunions, all of which required surgery. The time to union was faster in the group that received the nail, and the constant scores and DASH scores were improved in this operative group at all time points up until two years. However, in that operative group, there were uh, several complications, including medial penetration of the nail in seven cases that needed to be revised, and uh, two cases of nail breakage. So uh, nailing these fractures is not without its problems. I think some summary statements in regards to the use of intermedullary devices is should we use a smooth implant, those should be removed at some point to prevent migration to parts unknown. We'd also like to avoid excessive traction on the fracture fragments to prevent any injury to the brachial plexus and to be sure to choose an implant that's suitable for the fracture that you're operating on. We don't want to leave the operating room until the fracture is stable enough for full passive range of motion postoperatively. And to move the arm through some active assisted forward elevation a couple times a day is probably enough to preclude frozen shoulder or post-traumatic stiff shoulder. I've had to manage several patients who are treated non-operatively for clavicle fractures to develop intractable stiffness in the shoulder that has required arthroscopic capsulotomy. So we need to get these patients moving. We tell patients that easy activities of daily living are okay, but they shouldn't lift anything much heavier than a coffee cup for six weeks. They have to allow the fracture time to heal. Patients should understand that clavicle fractures are not necessarily going to heal properly without an intervention. And that subsequent healing is required to allow for optimal subsequent function. So the strut needs to be restored to its proper length. Patients should think about coming and talking to a knowledgeable surgeon should they have a clavicle fracture or should a member of their family have one such that they can discuss how to get an optimum outcome. We say the surgeon is the method because it really comes down to what we do in surgery. We have to look and study the fractures carefully. In this case of clavicle fractures, the bone is fairly easy to get to. However, it's not always easy to get a good outcome. Not every fracture can be managed utilizing the same device. We need to take into consideration the patient factors and the patient's aspirations, as well as the fracture morphology, and be very thoughtful. Thank you. So we'll now do some case presentations. Um, I think we can open the floor to some questions at the conclusion of each case presentation. The, this first case is courtesy of Dr. Jim Krieg, and I'll present this to Dr. Warm. This was a 12-year-old boy who was polytraumatized after he was hit by a car. You can see he has a displaced mid diaphyseal clavicle fracture. He also has a contralateral femur fracture. 
Well, I think this points out the fact that even young people can get clavicle fractures that may not go on to heal uneventfully. And in this case, we see no bony apposition, and therefore, this young man is at risk of developing a non-union because it's very likely that there's muscle or soft tissue in between these fracture fragments. What we also see is that the fracture is not particularly comminuted. And in this case, this is an ideal case to be managed with an intramedullary nail that can be introduced, uh, possibly even with a closed technique uh, where we don't open the fracture site and uh, give him stability back. Also, as a, as a uh, polytrauma patient, he's going to need uh, his upper extremities healed up as quickly and as functionally as possible. Another good reason to operate on the clavicle in addition to the femur. So that's exactly what uh, Dr. Krieg did. He nailed this fracture with a flexible titanium nail. At six weeks, you can see evidence of fracture healing without any displacement. And at 12 weeks, uh, even more fracture callus and the fracture is beginning to become fuzzy. And then at six months, the kid's totally healed and has a fully functional left upper extremity. Good question, Dr. Chapman. So if you can go back one slide. Um, so we just heard Dr. Warm talk about removing hardware. Um, this is a young kid. Uh, is there any threat of leaving this hardware in or should this be taken out again? I would recommend taking it out. I think uh, the literature supports the removal of smooth devices from the shoulder girdle. And uh, it's fairly unlikely that this thing will move. It looks pretty well cemented in there at this point. Uh, however, I would recommend removal. To choose a proper device uh, that would provide adequate stability, uh, how do you do that? Um, how, which implants are, do you favor for intramedullary fixation, and how do you um, go to another if you're not satisfied with what you've achieved? Uh, I think it really starts as you're analyzing the fracture initially, and I'm more prone to utilizing an intramedullary device when it's not a comminuted situation. I think when you try to use an intramedullary device in a comminuted fracture, you're setting yourself up for problems, and I'd be very quick to use a plate in, in those cases, because I think the, the fixation is just so much more robust and you can sleep better at night knowing the patient's gonna do well. I, I totally agree. I actually meant specifically when you're using an intermedullary device, how do you decide which intermedullary device and of what size to use? Okay, so uh, when you're utilizing these flexible nails, for example, the younger the patient, obviously the smaller the intramedullary diameter and so usually a child, you'll use a two millimeter uh, uh, device and uh, even adult females, 2.5 is probably as big as you can get and a, a large adult male, 3.0 is usually as big as you can get. So these, these devices are not particularly big. I would use the, the biggest one that I can get into the canal to get as much strength as possible. And uh, as Brett showed earlier, the anatomy distally, there's really not the greatest intramedullary canal, and you're essentially forming one for patients in some cases, and that doesn't really allow for a large device to get in there. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Hanel. Looking at this, and my, my first impression is that we don't have enough lateral fixation with this. How far do you have to go laterally? How do you know what your endpoint is, and can you distract your fracture with these devices?